Awad is actually coming from inside the Green Line. Uh, and so, you know, there's also been hundreds, if not thousands of demolitions inside Israel proper. We don't have the figures because they're hard to get. But in the occupied territory, since 67, it's about 55,000. And of those 55,000 homes, less than 1%, literally, have been demolished for security reasons. People have been accused of a terrorist attack or have done a terrorist attack or whatever, and the house is demolished as a punitive measure. So in 99% in of the cases of the 55,000, it has nothing to do with, with security. So it brings up the question, of course, what's going on here? If these houses aren't demolished for security reasons, then why are they being demolished? Oh, and all of a sudden you get a window into what's going on where you understand that occupation is proactive. It isn't defensive, it isn't reactive. It's proactive and the house demolition issue tells us what Israel's, tells us what Israel's intentions are, which is obviously to keep the territory. I mean, Israel has, no, has never had the intention of somehow detaching the occupied territory into a Palestinian state. And you can see that through the house demolitions. You can see that, and as a matter of fact, nothing that Israel has done can be justified by security. It all shows a proactive campaign of annexing and incorporating uh, the West Bank into Israel. You can't, you can't explain the crazy root of the wall that goes way into the Palestinian territory by security. If you want security, you build it on the green line. You can't explain uh, the building of settlements. There's close to 700,000 Israelis today living in the occupied territory. They're not there for security reasons. Israel never even claims a security reason for, for settlement. It's a proactive settlement of the land of Israel. It's ours, which now annexation that's coming up shows. Um, you know, the economic uh, closure, the impoverishment of the Palestinians, uh, Israel's refusal for years now even to talk to Abu Mazen and the Palestinian Authority. In other words, everything on the ground points to a, 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 an intention on the part of Israel to keep control and to annex. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, and essentially, it, it really brings out the apartheid nature of Zionism and the country. Israel can't go anywhere else. Once the two-state solution is gone, and I would argue that it never was, because if Zionism is, is a settler colonial movement that set out 100 years ago to take Palestine. The whole idea of Zionism overall was Judaization. In other words, transforming a, an Arab country into a Jewish country, transforming Palestine into the land of Israel. Not 78% of it. <laughs> you know, as a matter of fact, Judea and Samaria, as we call the West Bank, and East Jerusalem is the heart of the land of Israel. So the idea that somehow settler colonialism started out 100 years ago to conquer the entire country, <laughs> it succeeded. And now in its moment of triumph, it's going to give up the most important part of it to a Palestinian state is ridiculous. So it's clear from the very logic of Zionism, from the history and from Israel's policies on the ground, first of all, that the occupation is here to stay, or I, I'll put it another way, but, but there, there isn't going to be a two-state solution. But more important, and that's what segues into tonight, more important, I think we can, we can really make the case today that there already is one state, de facto, between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River. And it's Israel. It's clear. There's one governing authority, which is Israel. It's not the Palestinian Authority. There's one set of borders. You can't get into this country from any direction without going through Israeli checkpoints and border controls. There's one currency. There's one infrastructure. There's one set of laws. Uh, by any, any measure of what a state is, there already is a functioning state between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River. It's Israel, and it's an apartheid state, of course. 
because you've got millions of Palestinians living that do not have any civil rights at all. And you have another million and a half living inside Israel, like Awad, who have a limited citizenship only. So by any measure, you have what we call today, and that's why it's very hard to focus on one thing or another. We have to be careful of our language. We have today what's called the hybrid regime. And that is you've got a, a terrible combination in this country of colonialism, settler colonialism, occupation, and apartheid, all in one, one system. And, and so it's not a conflict. You know, we, we keep talking about the Arab-Israeli conflict. It's not a conflict because there's no two sides here. Israel has never seen the Palestinians as a side. It's never negotiated. Colonists do not negotiate with the colonized. They move them around. They displace them. They eliminate them. Whatever they do to them, but they don't. They're not equals. We don't negotiate with them. And so, uh, and so, uh, it's not a conflict in that you know the two sides can sit down and negotiate and come to some kind of a of a, of a technical. Uh, compromise and peace. It doesn't work that way because settler colonialism is not colonialism. The only way out of colonialism is to decolonize, which means, and this is kind of my bottom line, at least the way I see it, I want, uh, it might see it a little bit differently, but we're, I think we're on the same wavelength more or less. Uh, the, the point of decolonization is we say, okay, Israel, you've created one state. And Israel did that. In other words, this wasn't the trick of the Arabs. It's not a trap that Abu Mazen set. Israel deliberately, systematically, over a, a century, conquered, took over, and made this into one state with one army and one government and one set of laws and one infrastructure and, and all of that. Um, so in a sense, we have to say, all right, you know what? We accept that. You didn't want the two-state solution? Fine, we accept that. You want one state? Great, okay, we're with you, Israel. But it can't be an apartheid state. In other words, one state is fine. You created one state. You can't blame anybody else. Now our task is crystal clear. And that is to turn that one apartheid state that Israel created, we have to hold Israel accountable here, into one democratic state of equal rights for all its citizens. And that shouldn't be such a, a revolutionary, crazy, radical idea for Europeans, <laughs> a democracy, you know? So that I think there's a logic to what we're saying. There's a logic to our analysis. There's a logic to the settler colonial a process, uh, there's a logic to what Israel's doing, and there's a strong logic that leads us in the direction of, of one state, one democratic state. Because really there are only three options. One was two states, and we supported the two state idea for a long time. I mean, if it was good enough for Arafat, you know, I'm not gonna be more Catholic than the Pope. You know, okay, but obviously, that's gone, and again, I would argue that it never was. So then you're left with either apartheid, I mean, you're left with a situation where Israel is going to continue to control the entire country. So either you've got apartheid, where one people rules over another, or you've got, a, 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 you decolonize and you have one democratic state. So in a sense, that's, that's I think, the logic behind this. And so Awad and I and others are involved in this one democratic state campaign, which is trying very much to, uh, we, we formulated a very good 10 point program. It's just the beginning. We have to be participatory. We have to bring other people in. There's other groups involved. We don't all agree on everything, certainly. You know, we're, it's a very exciting actually enterprise of, of creating a new state in this in this in this region but not as an academic exercise as really a political option and so i think awad and i are agreed that we've got to be political actors 
we can't just be protesters anymore. We can't be academics with great articles and analysis. We can't just resist. We can't, we have to really jump into the political arena. And the only way you jump into the political arena is if you can suggest an alternative. If you have a political plan that makes sense, that's just, that's doable, even if it seems crazy in the beginning, uh, uh, nevertheless, that's what you have to do. And this has to be a Palestinian-led movement, of course. Uh, you know, I'm a partner, <laughs> kind of a junior partner. I mean, as an Israeli Jew, I'm a stakeholder, obviously. But this has to be led by Palestinians. And so right now we're in the stage of consolidating a, a, a Palestinian base of support, which isn't easy. And I'll, let, I'll want to talk about that more. Uh, but the idea is to more and more begin to let our voice be heard, our program be heard, bring people in, mobilize all of you. Because the problem is you're all mobilized. You've got BDS, you've got all kinds of campaigns, but you don't have a political program. And if you don't have a political program, what are you advocating for? What are you BDS? Yes, can you? And that's, I think, what we have to uh, insert in this book. Uh, Thank you okay. very much, Jeff. Um, and, and now we in invite Awad to give his presentation. We're very lucky to have Awad Abdel Fattah with us today. He's born in Northern Palestine in Galilee to a family who resisted the expulsions from their village. Others were expelled. Some of his relatives were expelled, but his family hung on bravely um, during the Nakba. And given his history, he's been a political activist throughout his life. He's first interrogated by the Israeli authorities when he was 14. He trained as a teacher because he wanted to teach Palestinians their true history, but was sacked by the Israeli authorities. He became a journalist and political activist um, and was constantly harassed. And he's a founder supporter of the One Democratic State campaign. Awad, we're very privileged to have you with us. Please make your presentation to the 90 people who we have here and we'll stream this thing more broadly later. Awad. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Claire. It's also uh, very nice, in fact, to be with you and to be hosted uh, on this program. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Jeff uh, gave uh, excellent introduction to the idea of the one state solution, but uh, I would uh, uh, say that, uh, yeah, we have been uh, trying to build a grassroots movement uh, in the last uh, three years. We think that it is imperative now to do that and to exert uh, every effort to uh, go ahead with this goal because the, the major challenge that has been uh, put before the supporters or the advocates of the one state movement uh, is the, uh, the, 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 the need to establish a popular movement that can become in a, a, an effective player in the political arena. And we are trying to do it. The, difficult, the job is very difficult, and we still have a long way to go. And it uh, uh, doesn't depend on us only, but on other groups who uh, advocate uh, one state in all of Palestine. Uh, and we need to network with them. This is what we have been, do, been doing recently. Uh, I personally, in fact, support both the one state uh, uh, from the very beginning, since my early uh, age. And uh, I belonged first to a movement called Abna al Balad, which was established in 1972. And I joined this movement in 1980, uh, at the end of my uh, university study. Uh, but I also was active during my uh, study in the university, late 70s, and I had uh, read uh, some books about the settler colonialism, like Faiz Sayer, the Palestinian intellectuals, who were the first to write, in fact, 
about uh, the settler colonialism and to apply it to Palestine. Uh, and then I think I remember I read uh, the book of Maxim Rodinson, the French thinker. Uh, his book is uh, uh, Israel is a colonial reality. And uh, so, but you know, as Palestinians, we knew about that instinctively. We we were aware. I mean, I mean, we we experienced that ourselves that we were living under a settler colonial entity because the, our fathers and forefathers I mean, told us uh, what happened in 48 and what was happening before 48, that there was a European group that invaded Palestine and established a state and the ruins of our people. And also we were direct victims of this colonial uh, project. So, I mean, uh, but we had in fact, the, no doubt that uh, reading enriched our knowledge and uh, consolidated our uh, resolve to fight this uh, this this Hitler colonial project, but as you know, but our uh, the, the, the situation of the Palestinian inside the Green Line is very complicated and it has been ignored uh, uh, by the international community and even by uh, the Arab world and the uh, Palestinian leadership for for a long time, and uh, we had to work, to have to take uh, our matters in our own hands in order to uh, highlight our tragedy or our plight uh, under the uh, rule of the State of Israel. Uh, we, uh, uh, some Palestinians, in fact, uh, some Palestinian intellectuals think that Palestinians inside the Green Line are the best, uh, are best placed to lead the one democratic state. Like Leila Farsakh, she wrote an article in 2011, and even some Israeli progressives think so. And that, uh, this really uh, is, is important, I mean, point to, to, to relate to. Because today, when we speak about uh, the one democratic state, which is not easy uh, job, it's not easy goal, I mean, after so long, after so after the fragmentation, uh, geographically and demographically and politically, that the Palestinian people has been undergoing, and you know this is is the strategy of the Zionist movement is to fragment the Palestinian people so that it can uh, control it easily. And what happened is that after Oslo, that uh, uh, the fragmentation deepened, has deepened, and now we are living really in a catastrophe because we did not. Even we didn't get uh, a state in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. We didn't get equality inside the Green Line. We didn't get back any refugee. But the more dangerous is that the tool that was supposed to liberate the country uh, is almost dead, which is the PLO, because it was tired of its goal, of its original goal. And you know, originally even the PLO demanded the liberation of Palestine, then moved to the goal of one democratic state in all of Palestine, where Jews and Palestinians can live together equally. But this did not, I mean, last for a long time. The DPLO, under the pressure of the international community, retracted it from this goal because it thought that what was unrealistic, given the uh, imbalance of forces existing in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the region or in, around the world. So, I mean, but uh, the Palestinians were deceived, and I think now they have to wake up and uh, do a, a, a shift in their uh, thinking that there is no other alternative than to uh, apply the settler colonial perspective uh, uh, on Israel and on the Palestinian cause and to uh, rejuvenate the Palestinian thinking because um, the reality uh, of one state of apartheid in Palestine has been evolving while the Palestinian thought has not been evolving. So what is needed now, I'm not saying that this absolute, absolutely that, but the Palestinians in fact, uh, intellectuals, academics, activists, uh, groups outside the traditional structures of the leadership are really active and dynamic and they are trying to create new things. But I mean that the two authorities in Gaza and in the 
West Bank are unable, are unable to, 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 to create, to be creative and imagine a different vision. So what we are doing now is we are part only, we are only part of a small group of many groups and uh, uh, frameworks that have been working hardly in order to create a new alternative, a new vision, a, a, a discourse of hope, a, a vision of hope for Palestinians and Israelis so that we can live equally together after the defeat of the apartheid colonial regime. So what did, what, what that, that, that may, there are major challenges uh, before us that we have to overcome or have, we have to cope with. I'm not saying that we can uh, overcome these challenges easily and in the near future, but we have to cope with these challenges so that we can expand our movement and can network with the rest of the one democratic state groups and also other groups because you know, it's not only uh, the uh, one state groups who can uh, achieve the goal because there are many uh, activists and academics uh, and uh, frameworks uh, uh, that, can, that are working in order to change the reality on the ground. So now we are uh, trying to uh, rebuild uh, 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 the, the vision, uh, which I, I myself, as I said, I, I was originally supportive of this and was involved in a movement uh, supporting the one state, Demo the one democratic state in Palestine. But in 19, uh, uh, 19, 1930, after Oslo Accords, of course, that was a surprise, was a shock for the Palestinians, especially in Palestinians inside the Green Line, who were left outside the solution because. Until that time, the international community did not relate to us as part of the conflict. And then we are not part of a solution. So we were left uh, in the open, in the wild, without relating to us what will happen to us. That meant for us that we will have to live eternally and as, a, uh, as inferior citizens. So we had to create a new pl uh, 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 political uh, formula, which is challenging the Jewish character of the state of Israel and demanding full equality. Because until that time, Palestinians in Israel did not take their citizenship seriously, in fact. They didn't think that they would become one day as, as equal citizens. But we have to challenge the Jewish character of the state. We have to build our movement, our political movement, which requires, which requires, which, which demand, or which calls for full citizenship and national identity of the Palestinians. So that discourse uh, at the time, we believe, and many intellectuals, Palestinians will believe, that laid the foundation for a one state in all of Palestine. And we, although we did not uh, uh, specify that we call for one democratic state, but the fact that we demanded the abolition of the Jewishness of the state and uh, rebuild uh, or, reinv or uh, re uh, reinvent Israel into a democratic, sta democratic state, that meant that this will open the way to one democratic state. Uh, so uh, without, uh, as long, so long as Israel is a Jewish state, no equality can be achieved even for those who are Israeli citizens, for Palestinians who are Israeli citizens. We are not equal, not only that we are not equal, but in fact, we have been subjected since, since 1948 for in, to internal colonization. Our lands are being taken systematically. Uh, the teaching curricula is being uh, distorted uh, and we are persecuted. And we are, and in the last 20 years after the Second Intifada, we have been under constant attack by Israeli officials, by Israeli official institutions. And we are related to as a fifth column or as a demographic threat or a security risk. So this is what we are uh, coping with. But at the same time, the, 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 the Palestinians in Israel have grown in their power. They are become more united. And this is could really uh, impact the Palestinian politics. But this depends on how we think, how if we can imagine a different uh, uh, approach 
to the Palestinian. Howard, yeah. can I ask you to end your remarks there? I want to ask both of you one question, then Linda's going to make some organizational remarks, and then we're going to come to the various questions that have been put up already by the audience, who are very sympathetic to the one state solution, but want to talk about how we take it forward. The question I want to put to both of you is that you've both stressed, Jeff as well, that it's essential that, that this campaign is led by Palestinians in Palestine. Now that's right, of course, the core must come from Palestinians in Palestine. And there's a problem with the leadership that keeps on saying two state solution, to, you know, like an old gramophone record, as though nothing has changed. But surely also, Jeff, Jews in Israel also legitimately must make the demand. And we, the solidarity activists across the world, naming apartheid and making the demand so that it, because we've got to turn over the rock of the two state solution all serious people know that it's gone but but we need to change the language and the thinking so isn't it that we have to combine our efforts in every level rather than as you implied jeff and i'd like you to answer first the palestinians must take the lead and we all sort of wait to follow jeff and then i'll come to you awad Is Jeff muted? Yes, he is. Can someone unmute Jeff? I unmuted me. Oh, good. <laughs> it's very unusual that I that I mute. Um, <clears throat> look, there's there's three there are three actors roughly in this whole drama: the Palestinians, Israeli Jews, and you guys, the international community. And by you guys, I don't mean so much governments, I mean more the people, the international civil society. Because governments aren't on our side either. Um, and that's something we can talk about afterwards if you want. So, so this is a Palestinian struggle. Now, the Israelis are in a very different place, Israeli Jews. They're the colonists. I mean, you know, this is part of the language we have. And if we start using the right language, uh, we begin to understand what's going on. By colonists, I don't mean that they don't have any tie to the country. I mean, they, Israelis would never call themselves colonists because that implies that somehow they're simply like the British that went to India or the British that went to Kenya. And that's not what I'm saying. I don't deny that there's a, a genuine connection between the Jewish people in this country. But uh, rather than coming as immigrants or coming as a people to this country, and recognizing they were Palestinians here, and then trying to get into some kind of an arrangement, they came as colonists. They chose a, co a colonial route. And that you just can't justify. No matter what your ties, your links, your sentiments are to the country, you can't justify taking over somebody yes, else. Yes, but how do we mobilize stronger okay. call from okay, all yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm getting this. So, so what I'm saying is, the Israeli Jews are not going to be part of the struggle. In other words, the idea, because people always ask me, well, what about the Israelis? You know, the Israeli Jews are, you know, how do we get to them? We're not gonna get to them. I think it's very much like South Africa. In South Africa, you had a very few number of whites. They were very important, of course. The, the, the white, they gave credibility. They were very important in many ways, um, but they were a tiny, tiny, piece of the white community. The whites in South Africa would not, were not partners in ending apartheid. And, and I think the ANC understood that. So the ANC was multiracial, but it understood that, that the white South Africans are not going to be a part of it. And, and apartheid has to collapse from internally and externally. Briefly, and that's, what we have, that's what we have here. What we have here is that Israeli Jews are not going to be partners. So the question is, how do the Palestinians, with some partners like me, some Israeli Jewish partners that, that are there, how do we link up to you all in the international society to create a kind of an anti-apartheid struggle that bypasses the Israeli public and that causes Israeli apartheid to collapse, at which point then the Israeli Jews will have no choice but to come into the 
into the equation. Thank you. There's a message here from Paul Seligman saying whatever he thinks as an individual, it'd be wrong for general solidarity movements to adopt solely the program of one strand of Palestinian opinion. We must struggle for equal rights and justice and, uh, as general principles and engage with all nonviolent strands of Palestinian struggle without choosing borders, mustn't we? Which must be right, even though we... You need a political program. You have to have a political system. program. Yeah. Awad. You focused on the need to work, Awad, you focused on the need to mobilize Palestinian opinion. There's other comments that opinion polls show most Palestinians don't support one state. And of course, the leadership of Fatah and so on are still clinging on to two states. How do we make yeah. progress? Yeah, this is the, one of the major challenges uh, standing before us, in fact, and we are aware, well aware of that, but uh, we are not giving in. Uh, the, you are trying to change the public opinion. And, uh, I, but I believe that uh, this is going to happen. I mean, I'm not saying that this is going to be final, that, because even within Fatah and within Hamas, are, you know, the, the, are, the suspicion of the two-state solution is uh, growing. And today, uh, very few who would really uh, defend uh, passionately the Tutsi solution among the Palestinians. But uh, they would think that this is the only, this, they adhere to the Tutsi solution simply because they think that it has international support. But on the ground, I mean, there is no respect for the international law because Israel is violating systematically the international law. And uh, not only that, but even those who, the international community, which is supposed to, to protect the Palestinians, start doing that. So Palestinians have to take uh, their, the matters in their own hand. They have to go back to 1948. Palestinians were asked to be humble in their demands, that is to give up the idea of one state and all of Palestine, and to be satisfied with a tiny uh, part of Palestine. And in, this, in, in return for that, they lost the unity of the Palestinian people. They, un, they lost the main source of their power. What is the main source of their unity? The justice, but how the justice. do we go forward, Awad? How do we go forward? Yeah, we, first of all, what we are doing, I believe that things are changing on the ground. And by the way, the recent poll showed just four months ago, in February, uh, or and it showed that 37 of the Palestinians support one state, one democratic state. This is... Uh, 40%, 40%. 30, 37% of Palestinians support the one state. You know, compared to 20% some two or three years ago, and 38, 39% of the Palestinians support that two state solution. But 62 of the Palestinians, they don't believe that the two state, sol that the two -state solution is, is, is uh, viable. So, but they don't yet, they have not yet decided what kind of solution they have to embrace. So this means that the majority of the Palestinians don't believe in the two-state solution, that it could, could be achieved. So what we, uh, this is why we are building, we are building this. We are right, trying to communicate with these people, to connect with the individuals, with forums, with academics, with activists, so that we can work together and try to change the public opinion. First, in order to, uh, uh, to change the imbalance in forces in order to force the apartheid regime to sit to the table and negotiate a just settlement, you have first to change the public opinion of the Palestinians. Because the, without, without the Palestinians, you wouldn't be able to do anything. Even the international solidarity can be larger and larger, although it is very important. But what being, makes the international solidarity work or activities, activism, stronger is what is happening in the ground, what Palestinians can do. If Palestinians can really uh, change the consciousness of the leadership or the class that is the social and political class that is supporting the Palestinian Authority, this is the first, the first step towards changing the imbalance of forces. Without, we can't go ahead to change the imbalance of forces while the Palestinians are fragmented, but lacking their clear vision. So what is the major Major okay. challenge is to do that. All right. Thank you, Awad. Um, mm -hmm. We've got a lot of interesting questions that cover all the issues that arise. Linda wants to make some um, 
announcements, organizational announcements, and then I'll try and group the questions so we can get answer, as many answers as possible and ask both you and Jeff Howard to give us put punchy shorter answers so that we've only got half an hour after that to try and cover the ground. Thank you both very much. Linda, over to you. Great, excellent, thank you. Um, although there are many familiar faces and names um, amongst you today, we don't know everybody. So I'm just going to talk a tiny, tiny bit about um, ICAD UK. So here um, in this country, we work on lobbying, awareness raising very much on the issue of demolition and displacement, as I said, grounded in the whole thing of ethnic cleansing settler colonialism. We lobby in parliament. We are involved with the European coordination of committees and associations for Palestine. We've always worked collaboratively with other organizations on various campaigns. Something that we're highlighting at the moment is about um, the NSPCC, which takes donations from the Bamford family who own JCB bulldozers used in the settlements and in home demolitions. That's one of the campaigns we are developing with others. We're also involved in highlighting the situation of the Sumaran family from Silwan in East Jerusalem. They are due to be evicted from their home. And so we've got a campaign that we're just getting off the ground now is to stop the JNF from that eviction. And it also includes um, uh, sample letters to uh, MPs and to pressurize our government as well to put pressure on Israeli authorities and the JNF. So two current campaigns we'd like you to be involved with. ICAD over the years, of course, has got its hands dirty on rebuilding homes. I have uh, talked about that before. We've got another project on that coming up. We um, also help to facilitate political study tours that go to both sides of the green line. These help to equip campaigners for their work back here. And so once the lockdown's over and there's freedom of movement, we will be doing that again. Do support ICAD UK. Sign up for our newsletters, for our actions bulletins. There's a slide you can see so you know how to contact us. Um, and yes, donate please to our work because we are political, we are not a charity, so we are dependent upon people like you to support us. Donations can be made online, you can see the slide now. And today any donations made will go not only to the work of ICAT, but also to building the One Democratic State campaign movement. Please give generously. We are committed to helping to change history. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Yeah, back to you. Right, I'm going to try and group the questions because of the time we've got less than half an hour and a lot of very interesting questions. Um, the first one in the given that annexation might be going ahead shortly, is Gideon Levy said, let it go ahead, then it will be absolutely clear that it's apartheid and it will speed up the resolving of the problem. What's your answer to that, Jeff and Awad? And please keep the answers punchy so we can move through a number. Well, I think, uh, look, you can never support annexation. You can never support a party, make it stronger. So, of course, we're opposed to the annexation idea. That will bring a lot of suffering on the Palestinians. They'll be much more vulnerable, those that are annexed, than, than actually they are uh, not being annexed. I all that now. The point is that, um, that um, uh, I think I agree with Guidon, and that is that 
even if an annexation, it is going to go through. I'm, 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 I'm sure of it. But even if it doesn't, it doesn't matter in a way because the card, the die is cast. Clear that Israel is not going to a two state solution. Two state solution is dead. And so, in a sense, it clears the air, at least annexation. It allows us to move on. We're, we're past this whole thing of two states and negotiations and this whole illusion. So, I think so from that so point of view, annexation. Point is, you, have is to going oppose, to you have to oppose annexation. It's a total breach of international law, it will cause suffering. But we all know in reality that if it goes ahead, it will make even clearer the fact that it's an apartheid state and point towards the sort of solution you're advocating. Awad, what would you say? Yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, I'd add, Colin Cooper, by the way. Yeah, the annexation will change nothing on the ground. Uh, you know, because the, the, the annexation as has been de facto. It has been of the last, I and mean, in Palestine, the West Bank and Gaza Strip has been under occupation and under settler colonial and apartheid regime since 76. And so all of Palestine now under, is, is, is annexed, is under the Israeli rule. So, I mean, what is Israel is going to do is just to formalize the annexation. So, I mean, what is required long before, in fact, not only now, we believe that it is catastrophic that Palestinians did not, I mean, uh, make sense of what's going, I mean, the Palestinian leadership, of what has been going on the ground. So now it is, this is, you know, annexation is a nasty thing. Uh, uh, apartheid is a dirty thing. You know, the, the worst thing that was is happening against Palestinians. But now it's time, uh, maybe this is opportunity for Palestinians to reunite and to rebuild their vision uh, as, uh, and to go back to the idea that we, the Palestinians, are waging a national liberation struggle. We are not, involved or engaged in a dispute between two states, the state of Israel and a virtual state, which is the Palestinian state, which will never uh, uh, be built, I mean, or emerge. This is what we have been believing from the very day, from the fir first day when Oslo was signed, we were very critical of Oslo. We believed in that day that this will not happen because we fully understood the real aims of the Palestinian, of the Zionist movement. So this is the time to, 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 to uh, mobilize and work towards the one state solution. Thank you very much. Um, given that Fatah and Hamas, Hamas is a compromise in the interim, the, the Hudna, um, have embraced two states. Is there any leading Palestinian figure, and the question is about Baguti, Marwan Baguti, is, has he taken any position that might move towards the one state demand? For whom this question? Mm. Oh, you, you, you take that one. Okay. Yeah. yeah first of all, uh, in fact, it is uh, unfortunately that Hamas uh, leadership uh, has uh, amended its platform uh, into two state solution. I'm glad that it abandoned the language, of the religious language, talking about Palestine, because before they talk, spoke about Palestine as an Islamic property, Waqfi property, which I didn't like, and I was a critical of that. I was really expecting from them, this is what I told some of their leaders in the West Bank, uh, I was openly uh, critical of their, what they have done, because I was expecting that they should, to, to change from a, a political platform which advocated uh, Palestine as Islamic Waqfi property into a democratic state where all people can live together. And in fact, they did that practically, I think, because under the pressure of the attention, because of the siege, because they can't move, because they are suffocated. So this is what led them to. But by the way, there are civil elements in the uh, uh, transformation of their, of their uh, thinking. And this is good. I mean, this could be uh, in, in the future be right because I believe or I, I, not only. But what about Marwan Baguti? What about Marwan Baguti? Marwan Baruti, I haven't heard really about him that he is supporting openly the one state solution. But what I'm sure that he is very critical. He has written a strong article criticizing the Palestinian leadership, and he believed that 
a new leadership must be generated, must be produced. This is uh, with, with different vision. I, I believe that this uh, leader w uh, has maybe believes in the one state solution, but I haven't heard that he is openly supporting that. Thank you. Um, a number of questions say it was U UN vote on the original partition that gave legitimacy to the establishment of the State of Israel. Of course, there were far fewer members of the UN at that time. Um, and of course, the UN constantly supports two states now. How can I put this to you, Jeff? And it comes up in a number of questions that the UN votes of the legitimacy. So how is that to be changed? How can the member states of the UN shift their positions um, when they've all voted for the establishment of the State of Israel and so on? Jeff. Well, that's, that, I remember a few years ago when uh, the UN was voting whether to, to recognize Palestine, Palestine as a state. A lot of us said, this is a trap. Because on the one hand, of course, anything we can do to advance Palestinian rights, we should do. Um, but, you know, once you, it, but by recognizing the Palestinians as a state, you're locking them into this two-state solution that we all know is not a solution, it's not there. So now you're in a situation where everybody will say, hey, look, we did what Abu Mazen wanted. We, we, we recognize the Palestinian state. Now, now what? Now you don't want that? Or now you want to destroy Israel? But, I mean, it, it's a very difficult process of trying to change, change the paradigm. I think that's true. And that's where we're, we're, we're kind of stuck. I think we have to, you know, the problem is going to be, and this is what we go back to, a Palestinian leadership. Because as long as you have a Palestinian leadership that is collaborationist, not only to Israel, but collaborationist to the international community that, that, uh, that plays the game that they want to play of conflict management, like Abu Mazen is and the PA, as long as you have that, you're lost. You, you know, you, you'll, you, it, it's just a cynical game. And only by changing that leadership, uh, you know, are you going to be able to change radically the message and say that we're just beyond the two-state solution for all the reasons we talked about, and now we have a new agenda. But to do that, like Awad says, we need a new political leadership. And of course, that, that kind of a message has to come from the Palestinians, uh, supported by people like me, but it has to come from a Palestinian. Here's a question for you, to you, uh, Awad. How will the Jordan and other Arab states react if Israel goes ahead with annexation? Unfortunately, the Arab uh, regimes are, uh, some of them are cooperating with Israel. We, in fact, we are not uh, uh, bidding on Arab regimes, but we are bidding on uh, the Palestinian, the Arab masses. Uh, who uh, have been revolting against their regimes. Uh, and uh, I think that this is uh, one of the main weaknesses of the Palestinian struggle, that we are not now in a good uh, Arab environment. We, we are, uh, most, most Arab regimes are engaged in, in, in uh, repressing their people uh, and uh, the Arab masses uh, that have been revolting against the regimes are really preoccupied with, daily, with their daily concerns. But still the Palestinian questions still in their hearts and they think that we think that can, we can mobilize uh, political organizations around the Arab world and uh, you can still see that the Palestinian flag is raised in, in, in many of their uh, political activist, uh, activism, uh, and uh, we are not uh, really relying on them right now, but uh, I know that the Palestinian Authority will continue to, as part of the uh, Arab League, will continue to pressure the Arab regimes not to go ahead with the normalization relations that uh, some Gulf states have initiated. Uh, so what we are, we are really uh, gambling on the, on the Arab masses, not on the Arab regimes. 
And of course, we saw the defeat of the uprisings of 2011. I mean, there's clearly enormous disgruntlement across the Arab world, but also enormous repression that prevents the yeah, people. And we are witnessing now a second wave of revolution. We believe that the revolution will, will continue. And uh, we believe that uh, this is part of a historical movement. Uh, and the Palestinian national movement is part of this. Uh, and finally, Palestinian masses, uh, Palestinians and Arab masses will be integrated and fight for one democratic world, one democratic Arab world, because today there is more consciousness of uh, civil rights, of equality, of freedom, of, the, of, of, uh, of uh, uh, democratic regimes. And I believe that uh, when, Palest when Palestinian, when, when, when Arab revolutions will triumph, they will support the one democratic state. They will look to the struggle in a different terms, in terms of equal rights rather than statehood. Thank you. There's a way to go, but <laughs> there's a question about settler violence. I mean, this is going to take some time. I'm sure it leads in the right direction and it will be the historical solution. But in the meantime, Palestinians are suffering in all sorts of repression and violence. And there's a specific question. I hope, by the way, all our listeners will look at the questions and see um, who has raised what. That there's a problem of settler violence. Can anything be done about that? Jeff, maybe. Well, you know, that is, you know, the settlers are a part of the, of the occupation regime. Settlers are part of uh, the Israeli military, you might say. Uh, and so, you know, it suits Israel's purposes, what they're doing. They're getting, they're driving Palestinians off the land, you know. Uh, so I think with the, with the settler violence, um, uh, you know, look, we're focused on a political program, which is very important. That mean that you should all stop doing what you're doing <laughs> and just do this. In other words, we have to integrate the activist struggles, like Linda was talking about uh, the JNF campaign. We have a house demolition campaign. Our groups dealing with settler violence and settlements and the closure. There's a million issues that are all important. So that we have a division of labor. Groups that are focusing on different kinds of issues should continue to do that we shouldn't let the pressure up you know uh, I, you know i don't mean by any means stop bdsing or stop doing all the campaigns or the lobbying all that's really important all i'm saying is we have to link all these campaigns and all these actions to a political program you know everything we did against apartheid in south africa had a bottom line the bottom line was one person one vote in south africa there was always that end game and that's what we're missing so we have to keep our campaigns going, but always in the direction of, of the end game, which means then that, yes, there's, I don't know if there really is, if there are really any groups around that are focusing on the issue of settler violence. That's one of the issues that I don't think groups abroad have really been able to pick up on too much. And maybe we have to, to look at that. Right now, as far as I know, there is no real organized opposition to, to settler violence. And certainly you can't expect the Israeli police or the Israeli army to intervene because the settlers are just an extension of them. Thank you. Um, there's a question here. Is the right of return a prerequisite for one democratic state? Yeah, sure. Uh, it's a prerequisite. I don't think that there is a legitimacy for the one democratic state initiative without uh, focusing on the right of return. The right of return is the return of the refugees, in fact. Uh, they were the first victims of the Zionist uh, settler project. They were the first to be expelled and uh, they have not returned and their even communities are fragmented. They have been living under a uh, miserable situation in all fields of life. So we, we uh, this is a major point in our political platform. So we are not going. And the, of course, and we could the, add that if everyone is to be treated equally, well, there's a Jewish right of return, so there should be a Palestinian right of return. I mean, that would be yeah, equal, wouldn't still, it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, even the question today, in fact, uh, within the, the debate that is going is, 
how can the Palestinians be uh, resettled uh, so long as because uh, the, 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 the many, much of their land and houses are inhabited by Israelis. But of course, there are people working on this uh, and uh, to do that so that we can't cause another Nakba for the Israelis who have been born here. So, but the Palestinians have the right to return. First of all, the Israeli state has to recognize the injustice that has made to the Palestinians and it has to recognize the right of return and then we will think how will be resettled in a way that will really would not cause another uh, injustice. There's a question about Balad, your party. I understand you stood down as the leader in order to be a leading figure in the one state campaign. But what is the attitude of Balad, if that's the right pronunciation, to the one state campaign? Can you answer that? Yeah, this is quite, it needs uh, at least uh, five minutes. I mean, this is quite complicated. <laughs> You know, Balad, uh, most of the uh, co-founders of Balad came from uh, political movements or backgrounds uh, which were uh, affiliated with the Palestinian liberation movement, morally at least, not organization. We were not members with the PLO because the Palestinian leadership did not share us in their, in their decisions. We are not part of any um, decision-making process. So as I said before, we are marginalized by the Palestinians, by the Arabs, and by the Israelis. So we have really to create a new political formula that can fit our reality, and also at the same time can help us contribute to the Palestinian national project. So in 1995, we established Balad, for, uh, and we thought that we should, for a while, abandon the idea of one democracy of the derivation of Palestine uh, because Oslo in fact legitimized Zionism by recognizing the state of Israel without asking it to grant equality for Palestinians inside the Green Line. So we were not mentioned at all. We were ignored. So we have to uh, create a new party, to build a new party with a political formula that would challenge the Jewish of the state and expose the contradictions between equality and uh, uh, the Jewish of the state. Uh, uh, so, and we uh, laid the foundation for uh, the, the one democratic state, in fact, by, by calling for Israel to, re be, uh, to, to transform into a democratic state where it can relate to its citizens equally, regardless of religion, ethnicity, or nationalism. Uh, so, uh, but over time, I mean, as the Sharon uh, reoccupied the uh, Palestinian authorities' territories, uh, we were, it was sure that there, there was no room for, 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 there is no just justification to continue to adhere to the two solution. So then we started our uh, debate within the party, within Balad party. We started, I initiated the, 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 the debate and I wrote a booklet about that, that it's time to open a discussion about the one state democratic uh, and to go back to the original uh, platform, to original uh, perspective. Briefly, so, I mean, Allah, please, briefly. Yeah, yeah. so Sorry. now, so, but, but uh, the, the, the Balad party, in fact, uh, because it, is, it has decided to be in the Knesset, so you have to recognize the Israeli uh, rose. So uh, uh, following the campaign, the incitement campaign, the intensive incitement campaign that has been pursued by Prime Minister Netanyahu and even the intelligence services. So the, 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 the leadership of the party thought that it would be, uh, in, uh, uh, would be the wrong now to, to, to change or to transform our political platform to openly uh, called for one democratic state. So I thought that at the time to step down, because this is not the only reason in fact, because I had to step down as a secretary general or as a head of the party in order to, because I had been for a long time as secretary general. So I had to give a room for, for the young generation to, to lead and this is what happened. But in fact, after that, when I thought that it was difficult to make such a shift within the party, I thought that I should step down and then initiate independent and engage in an independent uh, initiative with other 
Palestinians and uh, progressive Israelis to work on that. But I think that Balad is the closest party to uh, transform into a uh, one democratic state. Okay, thank you. Uh, now there's quite a few questions about the Labour Party. Um, I don't know who's supposed to answer these. You know, I left it after Iraq. I actually rejoined during the um, general election campaign, but I'm certainly not close to power or speaking for the party. My own view is that uh, the false allegations of anti-Semitism has, has terrified the, the current leadership. I've got a lot of time for Keir Starmer, but on this, I fear for his positions, because he's bending over backwards rather than trying to correct what went wrong before. Um, so the, the Labour Party is going to be very defensive and not very brave. But it seems to me that the way forward for everyone, both in the party and trying to influence the party, is the position that Paul Seligman is taking. And I want to bring you in, Paul, if I may, to just round up speaking from the floor, how you see the way forward, that we can't adopt one state as our campaign when it isn't the call of the Palestinians, but how by calling for justice and adherence to international law, we can challenge apartheid and take things forward. I mean, I think if that's the argument that should be taken into the Labour Party, so that can shift the ground. Whereas if we suddenly say not two states, one state, everyone will fall out and we won't make progress. That's my own view. Um, Paul, would you like to come in and just repeat the point you've made about how we can't all just choose our position, but we have to stand up for fairness and justice? Are you there? So maybe he's gone. Well, in, if you look at the questions, he makes a number of comments, um, and that's very much his argument, and I think that's the right argument. We who think in the end the historical resolution is one state can't get ahead of the Palestinian people um, and so on, but we can say apartheid is wrong, all this injustice is wrong, the breaches of international law are wrong. Yep, Jeff, go on. Yes. Uh, I, I just want to say two things quickly. Okay. Two We're coming things, to the end of our time. Two things quickly. Very quickly. First of all, pardon me? Very quickly. We're running out of time. Uh, can I say? Yes, go, go quickly. Okay. First of all, uh, first of all, all right. Okay. okay. First of all, um, that's, you know, that's where Israeli Jews like me, even if there's not many, can play an important role. Because to the degree that Israel weaponizes anti-Semitism and uses it very effectively against the Labour Party or anyone advocating for a just solution, that's the field that we can, we as Israeli Jews can jump into to try to debunk. So we should be used much more. I was very disappointed that Jeremy or the Labour Party never called on Israeli Jews to speak out. We tried, but we didn't get our voices heard. First thing. The second thing I just want to say is that, you know, we're in a process now of building a Palestinian base. You know, one of the, our camps is to get at least in the beginning a thousand Palestinians to sign on to our political program. Because then, I mean, Paul is right. Who are you guys? Great. You have a good idea. You have a program. You're articulate maybe, but you know, who do you represent? Why we can tell you if you show us that you have a following, that you're a voice, that you're an actor. And so we're, we're trying to get at least a thousand Palestinians from all communities in the beginning to endorse our program and, when, and to keep going, of course. But when that happens, we can step out and say to all of you, to the PSC, to all the other Labour Party, we do represent a voice. Here, here are the people that follow us. And, uh, and we can begin then to take that leadership role that I think is missing today. And it's true, okay. you can't just follow any voice. You've got to, we've got to prove that we actually do represent somebody. Thank you very much, Jeff. And thank you all. And thank you for the intelligent questions. I hope you found this useful and worthwhile and that we can do this more often and get more slick at it. Um, 
over to you, Linda, to wind us up. Okay. And thank you again on everyone's behalf to Jeff and Awad for their contributions. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, I do thank echo you. and you, Claire, for leading through this discussion. Thank you so much. And all these added insights that have come from the ground. Awad in the Galilee, Jeff in Jerusalem. Thank you so very much. This has been recorded. It will be posted on the website. It'll go out in our newsletter. So use it, review it, send this discussion to others. And our next webinar is going to be on Wednesday, the 8th of July, when we have another one of our patrons, Professor Avi Schleim, oh, in conversation. He's wonderful. Jeff, as well as Professor Nadara Shalom. Kervorkian from Jerusalem's Old City, and they will be addressing very much the situation on the ground at that time. We'll know by then whether annexation is officially happened or whether it'll still be in this de facto stage. And so it will be looking at the reality on the ground, um, settler colonialism, decolonization, trying to go into the subject deeper and bringing in some other angles. So thank you again, everybody, for coming. Please continue to support ICAD UK and the One Democratic State Campaign as we go forward. Thank you, stay safe, stay well, and see you again. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everyone. You.